Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a shorter video, so that should be a nice contrast to last week's behemoth of a video. This one is from Christianity.com's YouTube channel, and is a video that purports to contrast the way Christian morality and secular morality deal with the problem of evil. It's only two minutes long, so maybe it'll finally be the apologetics video that's honest about how evil fits into secular morality. That is, it's simple. Bad things happen because there's no good supreme being looking out for us, and in such a world we would expect bad things to happen with at least as much frequency as good things. That's really all there is to it, but I have my doubts about their ability to be so concise while being accurate, so let's take a look! People often think that the problem of evil is a real problem for Christians or for other people who believe in God. I actually think the problem of evil is even more of a problem for people who don't believe in God. Oh, okay. So the reason this can be explained so quickly isn't because he's being accurate and concise. It's because he's going to do that apologetics thing where they pretend like it's impossible for a conscious being to have preferences without a God. And so just dismiss the entire problem offhandedly. Wonderful. Because if you think evil is a problem, that assumes that there is a good and that there is an evil, but how can you have that standard unless you believe that there really is a God who governs a moral universe? The things that we call good and evil are not absolute points that exist independently of us. They are points on a spectrum that represent our preferences. If we like something, it's good. If we do not like something, it's evil. If we are ambivalent, then it's somewhere in the middle. So how do we determine what is good and what is evil? Is it really all just about preferences, and if enough people agreed that something that we now consider evil was actually good, that would make it actually good? Well, at its core, because of the subjective nature of morality, yes. Essentially. Admitting this will, of course, lead the apologist down the path to Godwin's law fairly quickly, pointing out that by that logic, Germany was morally right to do the Holocaust because enough people agreed with it. But here's the thing with that. Our moral compasses are malleable. It seems that evolution has programmed in some basics that are largely centered on in-group versus out-group morality. For your in-group, you share resources, you help, you protect, you behave altruistically. But the out-group are others, not worth the same consideration. Sometimes tolerable, but acceptable to treat with contempt, often culminating in violence. So the trick with getting people to consider the mistreatment of a specific group of people is to get them to think of those people as being in the out-group, others, not part of your own group. What has happened in modern times, especially since the worldwide adoption of the internet, is that it has become clear that there aren't significant differences between these different groups of people, and so globally we have come to largely see all of humanity as the in-group. So from the perspective of all of humanity being the in-group, no. Events in the past where the othering of a specific group of people led to things like genocide and slavery were not moral. And yes, I can pass moral judgment on societies with the benefit of modern perspectives. Because ultimately, social morality has not changed a whole lot in that time period. The only thing that has changed is which groups of people are viewed as less than. With myself personally saying no group of people should be less than. Now, that's the uncomfortable truth of the matter, that our morality comes mostly from just our feelings, rather than from a rational examination of the pros and cons of various moral actions. But this actually works in the apologist's favor. You see, they want morality to come from our feelings because they get to then give God credit for giving us those feelings. Except that's not how it works in practice. What ends up happening is that different people from different cultures feel differently about morality, and even within one single culture you will find a wide variety of opinions on various moral scenarios, and so the apologist is left making excuses to make their personal moral feelings the correct ones that are obviously from God. Anything that they agree with is evidence that morality was written on our hearts by God, and anything they disagree with is evidence that we are all imperfect fallen beings. Of course, this leaves the non-Christian with a bit of an issue. When two Christians disagree on a moral question, which will always happen, how do we tell which one is acting on their fallen nature and which one is acting on God's morality written on their heart? I'm sure they'll both tell you to examine scripture to see which one is behaving more in line with what scripture says, but scripture can be used to justify pretty much any behavior, moral or immoral, so that's not exactly helpful to us. So if we're not happy with morality being based on emotion, how can we evaluate moral actions in a more objective fashion? 
After all, the murderer might feel that murder is the moral thing to do in that moment. So if morality is based on emotions, who are we to say that the murderer's emotions are invalid? And this is where moral philosophy comes in. It's not sufficient to just accept everybody's moral opinion as equally valid, nor is it sufficient to say that morality should line up with any one preacher's moral opinions because they claim they got them from God. So we come up with a goal for morality. What do we want to accomplish through moral behavior? Something most people could agree on is to maximize well-being and minimize harm. So with that goal in mind, we can analyze any given action and determine whether it is in alignment with that goal. When the murderer murders, that might increase their own personal well-being a bit, but the harm that it does to their victim is necessarily greater than whatever increase of well-being they experience. Ergo, murder is wrong. We can also use the thought experiment known as the veil of ignorance. Consider any action that has moral implications. Let's stick with the example we've been using so far, murder. There are two people. One will be murdered, the other will do the murdering. You do not know which one you will turn out to be in this hypothetical. You see this potential action from behind a veil of ignorance. When the veil is lifted, you will either be the murderer or the victim. It's a 50-50 shot. So before the veil is lifted, you have the option of either outlawing that action, with the act of outlawing it being equivalent to stopping it for the purposes of this hypothetical, or allowing that action. What do you choose to do? Outlaw it, of course. This is a way to turn pure self-interest into the basis of a decent moral code. It actually has its origin with the political philosopher John Rawls as a way of figuring out how to set up a just society. Would you write a law on something if you didn't know in advance which side of that law you'd end up on? Now, to take it back to what he said, how can you have a standard of good and evil without a god who governs? Well, in direct response to that, I would ask, why do you think that God is automatically the standard by which we should measure good and evil? If we just take how this God is actually described in the Bible, he actually comes off seeming rather evil if we use either the veil of ignorance or the goal of increasing well-being and decreasing harm. So, behind the veil of ignorance, humanity is corrupt and does bad things, and the question is, should all of humanity except for eight people be wiped out in order to solve this problem? You do not know in advance whether you will be one of the eight that survive, and to make this one more realistic, instead of 50-50, the chances of you being one of the survivors is more like 1 in 3,750,000, as there were approximately 30 million people alive at that time. So when the veil is lifted, there is a 1 in 3.75 million chance that you will be a survivor of this genocide. Do you decide to go ahead with this genocide? The reasonable answer is no. The apologetics answer is to say that, well, God is the source of our morality, and as our creator, he has the right to kill us indiscriminately. But remember how, if I say that morality is ultimately based on feelings and societal norms, the apologist will immediately run to the example of the Holocaust to say that by my standard, that should be morally acceptable? Well, if God has the right to indiscriminately kill us, he also has the right to order some of us to kill others of us. And he has done this several times in the Bible. So are we to believe the Christians who led the Crusades when they said that they were doing God's will? There must be war. God wills it! If not, why not? How are we to tell what God's morality is when his book records him doing and ordering things that we consider to be immoral, when people who claim to speak on God's behalf also say conflicting things about what God wants and what God considers to be moral? Like I said earlier, they can all use Bible verses to back up their positions. So how do the non-Christians figure out which Christians are actually reflecting God's morality and which are reflecting the fallen sinful morality? They cannot all be right. Ideally, the way we would tell them apart is if God were to actually come down here and clarify his position for himself. But he seems to be in the middle of being the hide-and-seek champion of the universe, so he can't jeopardize that title for something as petty as clarifying that slavery is bad. Now, even if you believe that God is the ultimate source of morality, you still wind up with morality being based in human opinion, but with the added problem of being able to use the excuse that God's commands are automatically moral no matter what they are in order to convince otherwise good Good people to do bad things. So yeah, when it comes to morality, I'll take the secular godless view over that any day. I also think that the problem of good is an even bigger problem uh, for people who don't believe in God than the problem of evil is for Christians, because how can you explain the beauty of the universe or uh, the joy in a mother's heart as she welcomes her baby into the world or any one of a thousand other wonderful, marvelous things in the world that God has made. Yeah, this is that classic, if a thing in nature is good or attractive, that's because God made it. But if a thing in nature is bad or unattractive, that's because of the fall. It's not a great position. So how do I explain beauty? 
Well, beauty is subjective. Different people find different things to be aesthetically pleasing. Which, you know, you wouldn't really expect that to be the case if beauty is evidence for God because things are objectively beautiful or whatever. So anyway, there are two aspects to beauty, both of which at least have potential evolutionary explanations that do not require a God. First is that which is directly related to reproduction. We are attracted to features that signify fertility or the ability to provide for offspring. And we think kids are cute because, holy crap, they can be monstrous little shitheads at time. But if they melt our hearts with those big innocent eyes and adorable pudgy cheeks, then we're more willing to tolerate the shithead moments. And this form of beauty bleeds into other areas. Kittens and puppies are cute because of their big eyes, big heads, and small mouths in proportion to the rest of their bodies. Features shared by human babies. But what about a sunset, a painting, the bamboo forest of Kyoto? Why are these things beautiful? We don't know for sure, but there are several hypotheses. A couple of the ones that make the most sense to me are, first, there's the idea that we find things that are familiar to be beautiful. I've seen the moon most nights for my entire life, but I can still stare at it and appreciate its beauty. From an evolutionary perspective, finding familiar things to be beautiful can serve two purposes. First, it gives you an appreciation for your home, so you can find your way back using familiar landmarks. And second, while well, away from home, hunting or trading or whatever, celestial objects that are familiar can give you some comfort. But then we come to the beauty of the unknown, which can drive exploration. I am not familiar with the bamboo forest of Kyoto, but I would like to travel there to see it someday. So, and this is the second hypothesis, beauty could also be an offshoot of curiosity, which led our ancestors to travel, to discover new places, and sometimes to settle in these places, thus spreading humanity out and making us more likely to survive as a species than if we all stayed in the same place. So that's beauty. As to the joy in a mother's heart after giving birth, I feel like that one has a pretty obvious evolutionary explanation that doesn't require a god. Mothers who feel joy are more likely to provide care for their newborn babies than those who don't. But that feeling is not universal. Postpartum depression is incredibly common, and many parents don't feel an immediate bond to their children. I'm sure that's all because of the fall or whatever, but given that God decided which things to curse us with after the fall, this one seems particularly cruel, both for the parents and the children. And for every one of your thousand marvelous things that God has made, there's at least two horribly cruel things that God also made. Uh, so we should put the problem of evil into perspective and uh, realize that it, it may not be as much of a problem as people sometimes think. Eh, I will admit that hypothetically it is possible that an all-knowing being could ultimately be allowing a certain amount of evil in order to accomplish some greater good, and that this path to the greater good is just beyond human comprehension. So in that sense, yeah, the problem of evil is not the worst problem that the Christian God has, but it's still a pretty damn big problem. You have to concede some pretty severe limitations on God's power if you don't think he could have made a world with less suffering and evil, but still allow for the existence of free will, which is often the apologist answer to the problem of evil. I mean, never mind that the Bible never actually says that God gave anyone free will, and just ignore the Bible stories where God explicitly violates people's free will in order to accomplish his end goal, but even then, God could have designed a universe better than this one. But even if this is the best possible universe for humanity's existence, we're still left with a problem. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 through 14, that the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many, and the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those that find it are few. Meaning that more people will go to hell than heaven when all is said and done. And then in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, we see that the dead who have already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. So according to the Bible, it is better to have never been born than to live and die in this universe that God created. And of those who live and die, most will wind up suffering eternal torture. Which means that, according to the Bible, a better universe would be one without people in it. So God is not working to maximize our well-being. His plan is not what is best for us. Because what is best for us, according to his word, is to never be born in the first place. So even if I grant that a hypothetical all-knowing being could know how much evil to allow in order to maximize the ultimate good outcome, the Bible itself bears testimony that this is not what God is doing. But I mean, this is a moot point after all. If you think that God has to have some plan that allows evil for a greater good to come out of it in order for God to allow evil but still be moral, then you are admitting that God is not the source of morality. Morality is actually utilitarian in nature. 
So best to stick with divine command theory that gets the easy out of just saying God's commands are moral because might makes right or whatever. That's at least internally consistent, though it still leaves us with the question of why might makes right. Why does God get to decide on morality? Is it really just because he has the power to send people who disagree with him to hell? What is it that actually makes an action moral or immoral in this system? I have never seen satisfying answers to these questions. It's always just an assumption that of course the creator's will is what is moral, just by virtue of the fact that he is the creator, so he automatically gets to do whatever he wants with his creation, even if they don't like it. And frankly, that might be consistent, but it just seems downright silly to me. But the, I think the main thing to say about the problem of evil is that we believe in a God who has actually done something about the problem of evil. No, God didn't do something about the problem of evil. He caused the problem in the first place. Even if the Bible didn't flat out say that God created evil in Isaiah 45, 7, you still have to contend with the fact that the world that your God created is imperfect. If it were perfect, it wouldn't have experienced the fall. The possibility of the fall existing in the first place makes it imperfect, pretty much by definition. And that's even ignoring the fact that God created the serpent with full knowledge of what the serpent would do to mess up his creation. And that is ignoring the fact that modern Christians believe the serpent to be Satan, the being of ultimate evil that God also created. So yeah, put all of this together, and sure, God might have done something about the problem of evil, which I'm sure you're going to claim is the whole Jesus died for your sins thing, but God caused the problem of evil in the first place. This would be like a toddler purposefully smashing a plate and then doing a really crappy job of gluing it back together. Sure, he did something about the fact that the plate was broken, but would it not have been better for him to not have broken the plate in the first place? And God himself in the person of his son has entered into this world in all of its fallenness and brokenness and himself has suffered uh, the hardship and loss of life in a fallen world, and more than that, has died to redeem it. Okay, you say he suffered the hardship and loss, but did he really? He's God. In your view, he has existed for all of time and then some. To spend 33 years of that time as a human and to end it with the crucifixion amounts to literally nothing when you look at the overall picture. Is it really a sacrifice to spend a minuscule fraction of a percentage of your total existence doing something that you don't enjoy, but to spend the rest of that time living it up in heaven being the most powerful being in the universe? Like, apologists will say that it was a sacrifice because of how demeaning it was for him to take on such a lowly form, but in order for that degree of humbling of himself to actually amount to anything approaching a sacrifice of any kind for such an infinite being, he would have to have a sinful amount of pride. Besides, didn't he make man in his own image? So how is taking on his own image supposed to be demeaning to him? So yeah, it wasn't a sacrifice no matter how you look at it. At worst, it was a mild inconvenience. And does dying really even count as dying if you know in advance that you'll be back up and running in less than 48 hours? Like, if I knew for a fact that allowing myself to be subject to the same tortures and death as Jesus would allow all of my loved ones to have perfect, happy lives free from any hardship, all of their needs met all of the time, and I'd stay dead for less than two days and then be alive enjoying the same perfect, happy life as them, I would gladly do it. And I'm not even talking eternity here, I'm just talking for the rest of our earthly lives. So by proportion of time spent sacrificing compared to total existence, my sacrifice would actually be significantly greater than God's. And uh, it's our hope in Christ, in his sufferings, but also in his resurrection, that gives us the hope of a perfect world in which all things are made new. But why could God not have just made this one perfect? Even taking free will into consideration, assuming that free will is an adequate explanation for why the existence of evil is permitted, that would mean that in order for heaven to actually be perfect, it cannot have free will. So free will is such a massive good that all of the evil and suffering in the world is justified by its existence. Well, then, is heaven really going to be all that great if we no longer have free will? Because as long as you use free will as the justification for the existence of evil, then by definition, free will cannot exist in heaven, which means it is lacking something that is so good that its goodness outshines even the worst of baby cancers. Because if you allow free will in heaven, then heaven cannot remain perfect, unless you admit that it is possible for God to have created a world where free will and perfection can exist simultaneously. 
In which case you must then also admit that the universe that God made for us was not the best possible universe. He could have instead made a perfect one where free will would not be able to fuck it up. But he chose not to because he wanted most people to end up in hell or something. Some loving God this is. And I think rather than really a problem for Christianity, evil is one of the greatest strengths of Christianity. Well, doesn't that make a beautiful quote? Evil is one of the greatest strengths of Christianity. Philip Ryken. Because we believe in a savior who will redeem a fallen world. Okay, but if he has the ability to make a not fallen world that we go to after we die, which is perfect and still has free will, then he also had the ability to make this world not fallen and perfect. So God's a dick. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Troy Henry 6111, who says, no such thing as hate speech. I really don't understand why people say this. Like, yeah, in the United States, hate speech is protected by the Constitution, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's just that it's constitutionally protected. But that's also very United States centric. Plenty of countries have hate speech laws, and in such laws, they define hate speech. So speech that meets those definitions is, definitionally, hate speech. But in the context of the video that this comment was on, I had mentioned that Christians get away with talking about atheists in ways that would get atheist community guideline strikes if we talked that way about Christians, because it is a clear violation of YouTube's hate speech policy. It is a demonstrable fact that YouTube has a policy about hate speech, and has a definition for what it considers to be hate speech. Sure, it's not as specific as I would like, which allows for selective enforcement, but it is a fact that there are types of speech that YouTube considers to be hate speech. And so speech that YouTube considers to be hate speech is, definitionally, hate speech. Now, you are free to disagree with YouTube's policies, I often disagree with them myself, but that does not magically make the things that I disagree with cease to exist. It's just a fact of life that if I want YouTube to host my videos, I have to follow their rules whether I like them or not. Thanks for watching, I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your Rhino fix in before then, I livestream with Cirrus every Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern on my other channel The Watering Hole, and I stream with my partner every Tuesday at 1pm Eastern here. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and Sponsorships Manager, and special thanks as always to my Patrons, who are the attractive things in nature that were clearly designed by the god that is my channel. If you'd like to be sexy as fuck, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!